morning. I'm pretty sure this is the first time I'm giving this lecture to people in their pajamas. <laughs> so there we go. Maybe not. I've given this lecture numerous times over the years, and every time I give it, I've had to pretty significantly update the lecture. But the important thing to know is that the basic concepts stay the same. And if you know the concepts, then you understand the changes in the management that have happened over the years. The anatomy, you have to know the anatomy to understand why we do any of the things we do. The general approach to taking care of the immediate things that we need to do. And just the diagnostic modalities, I'll go through a little bit of the history and where we are today, and I'll touch on some specific things. I always like to go through a little bit of history because then you really kind of understand how we got to where we are today. And as with many of, of the topics that we talk about in trauma, a lot of the management that we do uh, came initially from wartime. Because where else do you have you know, the number of patients that you have? And kind of people get to experiment and figure out what works and doesn't work. The first written recorded case was back in the 1500s when uh, one of the French army surgeons actually saw a carotid artery injury that was squirting. And what else could you do but ligate it? Needless to say, that didn't turn out very well. The patient had a big stroke, and, but he did stop the bleeding. Not optimal <laughs> way to do this. And then during the, uh, the Spanish-American War and the Civil War, management changed. This was back in the late 1800s to non-operative management. It was really just expectant. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of delayed complications, a very high mortality, and in patients where they did surgical ligations for vascular injuries, the mortality was was like greater than 60%. Things changed a bit when we got to World War II, just our general approach and what was available, anesthesia, concept of aseptic technique, antibiotics. And then uh, it, it was instead of expected management, it was more of an aggressive use of neck exploration and mortality was decreased by roughly 50% by so again, thinking about the concepts of the management, you have to know the anatomy of the neck. And, and when I say, is there a design flaw? Think about what's in the neck. Look at all the structures in the neck. If you think about the brain, it's protected by the skull. The thoracic cavity is protected by the rib cage. There's a pelvic girdle. What do we have protecting the neck with all of these vital structures all cramped together? The platysma muscle. <laughs> I mean, what, what is, that's just craziness. When you think it's just a thin muscle layer covered by some fascia, not so great. This is actually a self-inflicted injury with a big shard of glass. And I mean, look how easily it's able to just open up all the structure. It's really kind of scary when you think about neck injuries. And that's why you have to really take these very seriously, even the ones that look the most innocuous. So just sort of, Going through all the structures, just to kind of remind you, there's all the aerodigestive structures, the vascular structures, the neurologic structures, the ducts, the glands, everything is in there. The airway, the uh, digestive tract injuries can occur. And look what's in there, vascular, all those, the, the carotid, the subclavian, the vertebral, the aortic arch, and major venous structures are there as well as the neurologic structure, the spinal cord, the cranial nerves, phrenic nerves. I mean, you can do a lot of damage from an injury. When you look at fascial layers, there's a series of fascial layers that enclose all the structure in the neck. There's a superficial layer that encloses the platysma muscle, and then three supporting deeper layers, the paratracheal, prevertebral, and vestibular. And when you look at how they sort of wrap around and intertwine, you understand why blood or air dissecting through initially, you kind of don't see it, it's tamponaded. And then there's major distortion. And this, there's also a setup for, instruct, for uh, infection, uh, especially from esophageal injuries. Historically, if, if you look back at the initial descriptions of neck anatomy, it was divided into the anterior and posterior triangle of the neck where the majority of major structures were in the anterior triangle, except for some important structures at the base of the posterior triangle. But what we're familiar with using uh, was actually first described in uh, 1979 by Rune and Christensen. It's the zones of the neck classification. And this was really originally designed just for surgical approach. It wasn't kind of the way we use it now. It was all about where do you make the incision, what structures are there. This is all based on anatomy. 
zone one being the clavicles to the cricoid, zone two, the cricoid to the mandible, and zone three, the mandible to the skull base. And really the way to think about this, and again, once you kind of think about this when you see an injury, think about well, what might have been injured. Zone one is actually a thoracic injury. Zone two is the, the mid neck, which is kind of what we think of as the actual uh, neck proper. And zone three is actually a cranial injury. And that's the way you have to think about these when you try to approach the actual one. What are our immediate concerns with all of these? It's, it's the same as with any trauma patient. It's airway, obviously ventilating the patient, stopping the blood loss, and you know, all the things that we usually do, we paying the oxygen many, any secondary injury. But more than almost any other injury, airway is paramount in these patients. It's very challenging. This is not, sorry guys, this is not the practice intubation <laughs> for the interns. These are, every time I see these, I actually kind of get chills because these go bad really quickly and they can be very difficult. You need to be ready and have multiple sizes of endotracheal tubes, whatever rescue devices are available. And in these, a surgical airway is really a possibility. So what are the indications aside from the obvious respiratory distress and hemodynamic instability? These patients can have a lot of bleeding and can be very difficult to manage. Hematomas can turn into massive hematomas quickly before you. The airway gets distorted. So you have to really kind of get the airways early. And you know, don't wait and don't give it time because you're going to lose the airway and it's going to be very difficult. Other indications, things like neurologic changes, mental status changes. Aside from this being a neurologic injury, this could be a massive uh, vascular injury. You want to be on top of these. And if you're thinking of transporting these patients anywhere, especially to send them for some quick x-rays, you want to think twice. And I have to say I stole this slide. <coughs> it's very, very old, but it's true. I mean, if, if you intubated any patient in CAT scan, it's an experience you don't want to do a second time. And with these patients, it's not going now. So just a, a few words about airway management. I mean, we used to do direct laryngoscopy with all of these. Obviously, video laryngoscopy is very helpful, but you have to recognize that if these patients have hematomas or intraoral bleeding, the video laryngoscopy is worthless. You can't see any. So again, kind of size up what you have and use the appropriate method that you think is Be prepared for a surgical airway. These patients come in, I start looking at their neck and where my incision is going to be because there's a real possibility that you're going to have to do and the cricothyroidotomies in these patients are very often even more difficult than the usual mess that we have in the cricks because you may be cutting into a big hematoma, the airway is distorted. So you just, again, you have to just in your mind really be prepared what you're going to do. There are times when you may see this, you may see a big hole and you see a, a tracheotomy that's already available. If that's what you have, grab it, secure it, and put the tube in. Basically, you're going to use whatever you have for these injuries. Remember, you have to think about thoracic injuries, hemothoraces, pneumothoraces. Think about, you know, exactly where your injury is. And always control hemostasis with direct pressure. Take those, you know, any bandages off. If, if someone unknowingly put a cervical collar on, you want to evaluate the wound where you have a, a huge hematoma. Never clamp anything, always direct pressure, avoid putting an IV in the side of the injury. It may just go into the subcutaneous tissue. Don't do anything that's going to make them cough or valsalva or do anything that might disrupt a contained hematoma. Just a few words about cervical mobilization. We pretty much all know we don't do this anymore with <laughs> penetrating, but just in case you see someone, there's no evidence at all. All the evidence was extrapolated from the, uh, the blunt trauma evidence. And in these patients in particular, it, it could be dangerous to leave the collars on. Obviously, the airways are difficult enough, but especially if there's bleeding and they have a collar on, it's difficult. Wounds get missed, and it's hard to apply hemostasis to wounds if there's a collar. So there were, there were several studies done, and basically what they found is potentially only the need for mobilizing patients that have neurologic injuries, 
But Peter Reed back in 2006 even showed that pretty much if they have an injury that's probably a neurologic injury, it's probably complete by the time you see it. So that there's even a question whether that needs to be immobilized. But the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma Guidelines, which haven't changed about this since 2008, they suggest immobilizing the C-spine is unnecessary unless there is an obvious neurologic or the patient is unconscious. And again, you have to kind of use the judgment. Is you, you don't want to leave the wound uh, and just put a collar on. So think about what you do. Now, just the general approach to management, again, which hasn't really changed over the years. Any patient that's hemodynamically unstable or has an obvious clear injury, if there's active arterial bleeding that's squirting at you or air bubbling in the wound, these patients need to go. There's no question about it. Simple initial algorithm, you stabilize them, you look at the wound, is the platysma violated? If the answer is yes, then you have to do more because that's suggesting that you have a deep injury, you don't know how deep. Even if it looks tiny and you know, you say, oh, it looks like nothing, you don't know. It can go very deep and look at all the structures that you have for you. Operative or non-operative, that is the question. And again, when we approach this, what are you looking at? The anatomy, is, as we talked about, is, is paramount to kind of honing in on what might be injured. So which zone are you talking about this injury? Is it? Keeping in mind that these zones are all based on the external injury. Just because you see an injury in zone two, especially if it's a gunshot wound, doesn't mean all three zones are not affected. So you have to think about that, and especially when you're thinking about the mechanism of injury. Think about these things all together. What does your physical exam show? What signs, what is the patient complaining about? And what does the wound look like? I mean, again, going back to our self-inflicted injuries, is there, though someone will try to convince me, is there any way this patient's not going to the OR? We're probably not fixing that wound in, in the trauma bay, though I'm sure there are people that want to try it. It's not going to happen. Mechanism of injury. You have to look at whether it's a low mechanism of injury, a stab wound, a very low caliber wound, like a BB gun, or any other sharp uh, objects, glass, versus a high energy wound, a gunshot or a shotgun injury. Stab wounds, obviously, it's, it's direct damage to the, the proximal structures that they pass through. Again, the external wound may appear to be nothing, but it could be a very serious injury. On the flip side, gunshot wounds, there's the direct impact of the gunshot wound, but there's also injury from fragments of bone, bullets. There's the permanent cavity, and then there's sort of a temporary cavity that occurs, and there's the blast effect. So you don't know what injuries you might have from a gunshot. And the path is completely unpredictable. The bullets roll around, you know, everything kind of fragments. Anything could be injured. So in general, gunshot wounds, you just have to anything possible. Shotgun wounds are just multiple pellets everywhere and, and generally involve multiple zones. This was a patient who came in with a shotgun wound and you could see what could possibly be injured there. Everything could possibly be injured. And this was a patient years ago who was sitting on a park bench and he actually was minding his own business. And he, yeah, he was actually shot. It wasn't meant for him, but the bullet actually went by. He was wearing headphones and came in with a headphone actually embedded in his neck. And I think there's probably about five people that I see and probably a bunch on Zoom that would remember what a Walkman is. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Sinner, we knew that you knew. This was actually a Walkman headphone. So this is kind of an old slide, but it's, it's the same concept. That's my first publication as a medical student that case. Oh, is that yours? I stole it from you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I kept it in there. First publication ever. Excellent. Dr. Silverberg's picture that I have. And this was actually uh, just for orientation. This is the head up here on the right upper. This was a bicyclist who was riding by and had the unfortunate thing happen that someone opened their car door. And he had this kind of big gash wound to zone one. And let's just talk about a little bit of the traditional management based on the zones and everything else that we just talked about. Again, this, these zones were created for anatomic access. Zone one and three are very difficult to obtain vascular control for obvious reasons. 
Again, any of these patients that are hemodynamically unstable or have obvious injuries go to the operating room. Otherwise, you kind of manage them based on where the wound is and the other we talked about. Zone two has multiple options and generally mandatory exploration versus selective management. So zone one, this was a patient who came in with multiple stab wounds to generally the zone one area. This was his chest x-ray. So he came in with a pretty large hemothorax and was found angiographically to have a uh, subclavian injury with a pseudoaneurysm that, uh, with extravasation. And this was all handled non-operatively because that would have been a big case to do up. So again, think of thoracic injuries, zone one, tube thoracostomy if you need it. You know, think about what vessels might be injured, and you have to always think about the airway and the esophagus of these. Zone three, again, you're up in the head. What's in the head? You're not so much worried about the esophagus or the airway, but you have major vessels and you have potential for neurologic. Remember to do a good cranial nerve evaluation. Think about what's up there, it's, it's pretty scary. And for the surgeons, if you do this operatively, to get in there, they basically have to disarticulate the mandible and cut it and kind of swing it up. So you could you can see why this is not a very popular operation for the surgeons. And to quote our first chairman, Tom Scalia, the number of times you want to be there will diminish with age and approach zero as a limit. You guys can hear him saying that, I'm, I'm sure. So the management of zone three, again, if the patient is stable, is non-operative. And we'll talk about CTA versus directly going to angiography. Angiography is, is actually therapeutic. So some of these cases, they might go to direct angiography, though we do that less and less. And operative repair only if revascularization fails. And this is a patient with a gunshot wound who sustained a... Uh, internal carotid artery uh, laceration, and this was all repaired angiographically with a stent graft. And this is a patient with a, a gunshot wound in an oral carotid fistula that was embolized. So no operative intervention was necessary, either of these. And just for another historic reference, this was back in 1990. Mike, you, you probably remember this. This was one of those famous cases from Kings County. This was actually before I was here. Uh, patient, it was actually a police officer who stopped someone, typical Brooklyn, going the wrong way down a one-way street. I'm not sure what made him think to stop this guy, because that happens all the time, but he did. And uh, he got out of the car, and, and the police officer was shot behind one of his ears and came in massively bleeding. Uh, the bullet went into uh, just below the ear and through his mouth, and he came in with you know blood everywhere, and his, his airway, he was losing his airway. So Tom Scalia, quick thinking, actually just went and stuck his finger in his mouth and tamponaded the wound and called Sal Stefani, who was our invasive radiologist, came in for every one of these patients. He said, get in here now. And while he waited for Sal, he just kept his finger in and actually escorted him up to the angiography suite with his finger in the hole through the entire procedure. And this was all handled angiographically and the police officer actually did great. So again, direct digital pressure. I'm trying to do anything else, and it worked out really well. So zone two is always the controversial <laughs> zone. It's, it's not as straightforward because you have multiple options as to what to do in zone two. And why is this? Because proximal and distal vascular control is relatively easy. You can kind of see everything in zone two. You can approach it through a, vascular, uh, through a standard neck incision, so you, you can operate if you choose to operate, you can kind of see all those big vessels and the nerves. What are the advantages of one method over another? Mandatory exploration, easy to see, relatively low complication rate. You don't depend on all of your ancillary services. The workup doesn't take 10 hours. What's the disadvantage? Obviously, there's a very high negative exploration rate by doing this. Injuries can be missed. Uh, you might get into injuries in zone one or zone three that become things that you weren't expecting to happen. And obviously the patient has to have an operation. So the concept of selective management evolved, whereby 
you can do a lot of non or less invasive things to try to diagnose the problems. Remember, we have the esophagus, we have the airway, a lot of potential things that could be injured. Uh, so it, some vascular injuries are amenable to angiographic treatment, uh, shorter hospital stay in general, but the disadvantage is it's really labor intensive. These workups used to go on all day when you the angiography and the esophageal workup, and if they needed a bronchoscopy, and you have to have those ancillary services available. To you. If you're in a hospital that's not a level one trauma center, you don't have these people available. I mean, now, you know, times are different now because our management is different. Have you ever tried to get an invasive uh, radiologist in to do an angiography, even during the day? It's, it's pretty much impossible. It's, it's very difficult. So again, we kind of go back to those initial things that we were talking about. Where is the wound? Is it a high wound that might affect zone three or low that affects zone one? Is it a wound that you really have to fix in the OR anyway, so you might as well take them to the OR? Is it a stab wound or a gunshot wound where you expect more injuries? What are their physical exam findings and what services do you actually have available? This was a patient with multiple stab wounds in zone two, but he had a, a fair amount of subcutaneous emphysema, so the decision was to take him to the OR. He was maintaining his airway, but this is what he had when they explored. He actually had a tracheotomy. I think this is a little bit bigger than what he had, but he had an injury, so it made sense to just take him to the OR. This is a patient, again, for orientation. This is the head on the top. This is a, just a slash wound to zone two. And it was bleeding profusely. And looking at this wound, you're not going to deal with this in the ER. You're not going to work them up. He actually had an internal jugular injury. So he also went right to the operation. That made the most sense. This was a patient with a gunshot wound to zone two, but he just had a small hematoma and he was completely stable. So he had an angiography and, and you could see he had a, a carotid artery near complete transection. They decided this was not a good idea to handle non-invasively, and he went to the operator. This was prepared surgery. So just to kind of sum up, I mean, it, it's a lot of decisions, but essentially it's, it's basically pretty simple. If they're unstable or have obvious injuries, then they need to go to the OR, with some exceptions potentially, and geographic. And otherwise, think about where the injuries are. Zone three is pretty much the CTA or angiography. Zone one, same thing, but you have to be concerned about the esophagus and the trachea. And zone two, again, esophagus and trachea, but you have different uh, possibilities of managing. Just to spend a few minutes on the physical exam, because, you know, we talk about all these tests, but what about examining the patient? I know we don't do that anymore, but it's kind of important. Does the patient have hard signs, soft signs, or are they asymptomatic? That's kind of your three categories. And the question you have to ask, and this is the question that's been addressed in the literature for years, can physical exam reliably detect vascular and visceral injuries? And if a patient has a normal physical exam, is that enough? Can you just say, okay, this guy's okay, I don't have to do anything. What is that okay? And this is kind of the typical patient. I mean, the patients that are unstable are almost easy because you know where they're going. This is a patient who has a slash wound, he's talking to you, he's fine but it violates the platysma. Do you have to operate on him? Does he need a giant workup? I mean, what, is this okay to just watch him for a while or just send him home? That's the question. So again, think of all the things that could be injured. Think about <coughs> what findings you're looking for. Vascular injuries, you're looking for hematomas, pulsatile bleeding, pulse deficits, bruise, neuro deficits. Airway injuries, think of everything that goes along with that. sub emphysema, hemoptysis, voice changes, pharyngo, esophageal, dysphagia, hematemesis, and bloody saliva. All the things that go along with neurologic and cranial nerve injuries. And what's the evidence for the reliability of physical exam? Well, it's not great if you look at the literature, but the literature in general is not great. It's a lot of retrospective, small studies over the years, kind of typical trauma studies, and it's been a source of debate forever. Think about hard signs in general, and you know, part of the problem is if you read these studies, no one even agrees on the hard signs, with the exception of a few hard signs, like active arterial bleeding, 
air bubbling in the wound and hemodynamic instability. Otherwise, every paper has different definitions of hard signs. And then they secondarily have different definitions of soft signs. So it, it's crazy when you start reading some of those papers. There, there have been studies going back to 1975. Some say physical exam is great. Some say physical exam is terrible and don't use it for anything. Others say vascular injuries are, are good to diagnose on physical exam. And through the literature, that's been pretty much the one thing that we can agree on is that the studies are most accurate for, for detecting arterial injuries. And that's pretty much been agreed upon and has borne itself. Limitations of all these studies, they're mostly retrospective. Some of them are tiny, 10, 15 patients. Um, vascular injuries are defined by the need for surgical repair, so no one addresses minimal injuries that may require anticoagulation or years later may actually have problems. Pseudoaneurysms or fistulas, they kind of don't get addressed in most of these studies. And just a few words about airway injuries. Most of them are anterior, so most of those are symptomatic. Uh, these encompass about 10% of all injuries. Remember, these are zone one and zone two. And remember, airway management is the most important thing. Laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy are generally reserved for symptomatic patients, but if something doesn't make sense and patients remain symptomatic, then you want to consider moving to those studies. Esophageal injuries are the biggest problem. Again, zone one and two, many of them are asymptomatic initially. And if we miss them early and wait until they declare themselves, there are major morbidities and mortalities. So these really have to be evaluated. So putting together all the studies up to this point, physical exam may be most accurate for, again, determining the presence of arterial injury, least accurate for esophageal injuries, and venous injuries are also not so easy to detect, but most of the time, many of them can just be ligated and they're less of an issue than obviously the arterial injuries. So just to hedge again with a lot of these guidelines, these were the EAST guidelines from the same paper that I described before in 2008. Careful physical exam is more than 95% sensitive for detecting arterial injuries that require repair. And then a couple sentences later, they say, given potential morbidity of missed injuries, imaging is still recommended. So there you go. Physical exam is inadequate to rule out injuries to the aero digestive tract. And we've come a long way in our management from a lot of this initial literature back in the 1980s. And where are we today? So I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about CTs and what we call the no zone approach. We CT everyone, right? So why not CT all these patients too? I mean, it's great. You don't have to really think about, you know, the zones and argue with the trauma service about whether it's a borderline zone one or two and your management changes and all that crazy. So CT has really kind of changed everything, hasn't it? But there are limitations to CT, and you have to recognize what those limitations are to understand what you can and can't do and, and what you need to do to take care of the patients. Obviously, it's not invasive. It's very available. We do these all the time. We get the data back quickly. You know, at this point, we have pretty high-resolution images. You know, they're beautiful with our current generation of CT scanners. You can visualize everything, the vascular structures, aerodigestive, all those things. And let's look at uh, some of the studies for this. Monero back in 2002 looked at CTA versus angiography and found really good sensitivity, 100%, good specificity, 100% negative predictive value for arterial injuries, especially major carotid and vertebral injuries. So this goes along with everything we've been saying about identifying arterial What he also stated, and you have to know your limitations of any study you do, you're limited in, in gunshot wounds to some degree by artifacts. We can miss those subtle lesions I was talking about that are not described. And some of these you may think are actually managed better by angiography because that can be therapeutic. This is just diagnostic. So you have to keep that in mind if the patients are very sick. Morales Uribe did a systematic review in 2016 and looked at the operating characteristics of CTA and said they are, in fact, adequate to rule out vascular injuries. So we're pretty comfortable saying, you know, if it's a negative study for vascular injury, the patient doesn't have, or at least an arterial injury, the patient doesn't have 
the interrupter. Gracias uh, went one step further and actually looked at the use of CTA as a primary screening tool based on trajectory. And this kind of makes sense. This is very helpful. You can eliminate a lot of these studies if you can see the trajectory is just remote from everything. It doesn't go near anything, then you're probably fine not doing anything. Maybe observing them, maybe even setting them home, depending We are finally finishing the manuscript. Yes, Dr. Singer, finally. <laughs> uh, looking at uh, a CTA specifically for error digestive injuries. We did a, a systematic review. And when we went through it, we came down to seven studies, and they had moderate to high bias. It was a total of 877 patients. And the operating characteristics look pretty good, right? Sensitivity of 92% for detecting these injuries, specificity of 88%, and a negative uh, likelihood ratio of 0.14. But really, clinically, when you look at it, there are some problems with this. It was actually pretty good for airway injuries. There were no missed airway injuries. Uh, most of them were symptomatic, but the CTA picked up all the airway injuries. The few that were asymptomatic, it picked those up. There were seven missed digestive tract injuries. And let's look at the numbers. Of 877 patients, there were only 26 total esophageal injuries in the entire study. So that's what we're basing everything on, 26 injuries. Esophageal injuries are pretty rare in these patients. And in those 26 injuries, five of them were missed by CTA. So that's a 19% miss rate. That's really scary when you look at esophageal injuries that we know if, if they're missed, they have a very high morbidity of mortality. So not so good for esophageal injuries. And just going through the studies in general, the data is very heterogeneous. They all have different inclusion criteria. Their workups are different. Just as I was saying through the literature, hard and soft signs are defined differently in all of these studies. Some of the CT scanners are from early studies, so the generations are very different. Some included asymptomatic patients, some didn't. They mixed up gunshot wounds and stab wounds, and those are very different injuries. Some of them looked at all the zones, some of them just looked at zone two. So the data is kind of all over the place. So it's hard to make definitive statements about a lot of this data. So to conclude looking at our data, same thing. CTA is good for detecting airway and arterial injuries. It is not sufficient to exclude digestive tract. So in a patient that has kind of an innocuous stab wound, but you think it may be in proximity to the airway and the esophagus, and the patient looks fine and someone wants to send them home, not a good idea. Be aware of those missed esophageal injuries. CTA can exclude injury if it is clearly remote by trajectory. And what the studies have shown, several of the studies, is that there are certain signs you can use that may actually aid us in kind of risk stratifying these patients and showing which patients might be high risk because they have emphysema in the deep neck spaces, and those patients require further. So it is good for kind of risk stratifying patients as well. Just looking at the algorithm from the Western Trauma Association uh, for managing neck injuries, and I put this up, it's the slide they always say don't put in because it's a mess and it's confusing. Well, that's what we got. I mean, this really kind of sums up the algorithm. But if you break it down kind of simply, it, it's patients that are hemodynamically unstable or have hard signs go to the OR. So that's pretty obvious. And the rest of it is, is just what we're talking about. You kind of break it down into where you think the injury is, where you, what you think might have been injured. Zone three, you don't worry about the esophagus. So basically they're suggesting CTAs for all these patients, for the most part is screening. So they get CTAs, zone three, if it's negative, you're pretty secure, you don't have a vascular injury because that's what we worry about in zone three. Zone one and two, we worry about the esophagus and the airway. So if you look at a negative CTA, you still have to do something for those. Patients that have significant symptoms is the only disclaimer zone two. They can go directly to the OR or directly to the OR. Limitations of CTA, again, no limitations of your tests. The streak artifact, if it's a low zone one or high zone three injury, there may be, they may be difficult to read and they may be easily missed. Small intimal flaps again, pseudoaneurysms and fistulas may be missed. It has to do with the protocol and the way they infuse the dye, the image quality is affected by the technique. And who's reading the CT? Is it 
you know, the PGY2 radiology resident at two in the morning, or is it, you know, the, the neuroradiologist who reads these all the time at two o'clock in the afternoon? And remember, these are diagnostic, they are not therapeutic, so you use the tests are all complementary to each other. And just kind of talking about trajectory, this was just a case we had years ago, an 18-year-old who was just sitting on a bench and felt what he described as a mosquito bite in his neck, and then he just saw blood kind of pouring down his shirt. He came in, he was, his vitals were fine, he was fine, he was talking, he just said, this hurts, and it's bleeding, can you help me? And he had a CT done, and it just showed, if, if you see the little pellet, he actually had a BB wound. It was pretty lateral. And you can see it was just lodged in his sternocleidal mastoid muscle, kind of a low impact wound near nothing, and the patient got sent home. So he, he avoided a huge workup because it, he had a very clear trajectory. Just a few words about other evaluation. Angiogram, again, is both diagnostic and therapeutic. We rarely do it in patients diagnostically if they're stable anymore, but it's an option. Uh, access to zone one and three injuries where surgical repair is difficult and can be used in conjunction with CTA. And for esophageal injuries, if the findings are equivocal on CTA and the trajectory is con con concerning, Esophagram usually is the first step, and then uh, endoscopy increases that sensitivity if there's still questions after. Laryngotracheal injuries, again, are usually uh, symptomatic, but if there's a question, CT is a very good test to try to identify. What other questions do we have going through all of this that really haven't been answered? If we decide to observe a patient who's asymptomatic, how long do we observe them for? Again, the literature goes from sending them right home to keeping them for 48 hours. And if we decide we want to observe them, does it make just more sense to get some more data and do a CTA and work them up and send them home and be done with it if there's not clinically significant? Also, if you don't have the latest generation CT scanner, is that as good as you know, some of the older scanners? You don't know the answer to some of these questions. So just to kind of summarize everything I've said, the concepts stay the same, even though the management has evolved. So if you know the anatomy and you know the concepts of where the injuries are, the management really, it's second nature and it all makes sense. Secure the airway, do not wait. If you have a question and have to think about it, secure the airway, because it will be very simple. Management, there are different options, so it's, it's not the one-size-fits-all concept, and I know that in my life, nothing is one-size-fits-all. Hear what anyone's know. Respect the mechanism of injury, the wound location, signs and symptoms to guide your management. CTA plus physical exam is really the way we should screen and take care of these patients. Always be aware of the colostophageal injuries and let your clinical judgment, in addition to your diagnostic work, of yield your results. And that is it. Hopefully everyone has changed out of their pajamas. <laughs> Any questions? I'm happy to answer. So, um, Bonnie, I think in the 25 plus years that we've got to, I've seen this lecture probably close to it a dozen times, huh? and I enjoy it every time I see it. <laughs> I have to tell you that. And the old pictures just on this old, uh, old, old uh, morning, the old pictures bring a little warm. Absolutely. What I, I do want to uh, stress is someone as well versed as Dr. Barron. Who is, you know, this is a very uncomfortable topic. It's very, it really, really tests the native metal of you when you're in there. But for even someone like her, the, the stress is get the, get, load the boat. Then he says, get the, you know, get trauma involved or this is not the kind of stuff that you do. You want to be cavalier. You have to get the surgeons involved in this early. And I just want to stress that. But thank you, that, that was great. Thank you, Mike. And absolutely. I mean, these patients go from looking like a rose to, oh, my God, how am I going to intubate this guy? The, the hematoma that you think is a non-expanding hematoma becomes expanding very quickly. So if you think about it, stabilize them. And as Dr. Pacey said, get everyone involved that you need. Or, One thing I did learn over the many years of seeing these patients is don't play around in the I see all these surgeons come down and want to poke around. I remember a case I had with Bob Schultz. It wasn't that big an injury. 
but he put a probe in there and he's like, Bob, just take him to the OR, don't mess around. He's like, no, no, it's fine. And he started moving stuff around and he touched the esophagus or the uh, trachea, the guy coughed and a big jet of blood just squirted out and then bubbles came out and he started exsanguinating in front of us. Just don't mess around in the wound, get your CTA if you have to, but don't play in the wound. You're, you're just bound for trouble if you mess around. The longer you do this and the more of these you see, you just, I get scared every time they come in. These are the only cases that still make me nervous, really. It's You're scared. Casualties. And the airways are nightmares. So you really, you get very humble very quickly when you have to do this. So I, it seems like the esophageal injuries tend to be like kind of the biggest thing we have to keep in the back of our mind. Do you mind just refreshing like, what should peak our clinical suspicion that, okay, we need to start worrying about that a little bit, like in terms of like their physical exam? And- well, real, I mean, and that's kind of the take home point is that they may have a normal physical exam. Really, any injury in zone one or zone two, all bets are off. They could have esophageal injuries. Okay, if, so. if you do study them and the trajectory is anywhere <clears throat> near any of those aerodigestive injuries, they need to be addressed. It's only if you are sure, and you can't tell that from physical exam. You're sure it's not anywhere near the esophagus. But again, the physical exams, once the platysma is violated, you have no idea how deep that wound goes. And you see how superficial these structures are. So even if the wound doesn't go that deep, you don't have a lot of space there. And that's the problem. These patients look like they have nothing wrong with them. So pretty much if it's a zone three injury and it's not a gunshot wound and it's really far the esophagus, you're probably okay. Another question? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Ben.